Hello, this is Anna, and we're going to continue on with our histology, looking at part four, focusing in on our glandular tissues. We're going to kind of apply some of the functional information we've learned about the epithelial tissue types. All right, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody starts memorizing the differences between exocrine glands versus endocrine glands. Basically, you got three things. Endocrine glands have no duct and they secrete hormones. Exocrine glands have a duct and they do not secrete hormones. They secrete mucus, sweat, oil, saliva, and other doodads. Okay. Now, when we are looking, so we're going to stop talking about endocrine glands now. That's AMP2 material. We're going to focus in on exocrine. With exocrine, we can talk about unicellular versus multicellular. The unicellular gland that we mostly talk about in this course are goblet cells, which I've already shown you, single epithelial cell that makes and secretes mucus. Everything else is gonna be multicellular. Now, when we are looking at these multicellular glands, we like to organize them based on whether they have a simple duct structure or a compound duct structure. So if we look over here at these, you will see you've got the one duct and then it's got branches off of it. One duct, no branches. Over here, I've got a duct and then I've got um, three major branches and then off of those, more branches. So this is a more compound structure. So if it looks like tree roots, it's compound. If it looks like a duck's foot, it's a simple branched, okay? The other thing we're gonna look at is the shape of the tube at the base where the product is first being secreted into it. So if you look here, they're showing these in two different colors. They've got the pink versus got the, the tan color and the same thing, tan and the pink. So this is where you're really doing synthesis is down in the pink and then where it's the tan color, it's more of a pathway, okay? Now I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. All right, so what you will notice is the collection point in the tubular secretory structure. So right here, the tubular secretory structure follows a tube-like pattern. It's narrow, okay? The alveolar secretory structure, in contrast, has a more rounded basin where it's collecting the initial um, secretion of the product, okay, whether it's mucus or sebum or milk or whatever, okay? So that is another structural difference. Um, all right, let's move on to the next slide. So right here, we've seen this picture before. You've got your goblet cell right here. You can see it's opening, all right? And then you can see over here, we've got this simple columnar epithelium, all right, with cilia on the surface. Over here, again, we've got, actually, this is PCCE, because you can see kind of like right like that. Okay, so the nuclei are not lined up neatly. Okay, so it's PCCE, all right, because that's cilia. And then right here, you can see the goblet cell. Okay, let's look at the next slide. All right, here we're going to kind of build on some of the complexity that we've already been talking about. So we'd already talked about the tubular shaped cells versus the alveolar shape. So the tubular has the tube, the alveolar, where you're collecting the product is more of a circle. It's still lined with simple cuboidal epithelium. All right, both of these are still simple cuboidal. The acinar what happens is with the acinar cells, you're producing even more stuff and the cuboidal cells swell, okay? So instead of it being just a cube shape, because it's gotten so fat, it takes on more of a flat top triangular shape, okay? Um, it still functions the same. We still call this simple cuboidal, even though it's shaped a little bit different. Okay, so here's some examples right here. Here we're looking at a sweat gland. 
and I can see the lumen of the tube here, and then I can see the simple cuboidal epithelium right there, um, and this is a tubular form, okay? Over here, what's interesting on this particular picture is I have stratified cuboidal, okay? And this is a sebaceous gland. And basically, the cells are stacked on top of each other. And because they are actually more of the asinar shape, they're, they're more swollen, um, when they start to stack up, they, they kind of lose a little bit of their geometric shape. But they are still considered stratified cuboidal in the asinar format. Now, sometimes we will call these asini cells, asini cells as kind of a shortcut. What's also interesting with this picture is that we've got the stratified cuboidal here, but then here we are switching to stratified squamous as we are aligning our hair follicle. Okay? All right, let's look at the next slide. All right, here are some more examples from photomicrographs and drawings. So if we're looking over here at our mammary gland, you can see the lumen of our tube and you can see just pretty much classic simple cuboidal epithelium, okay? Down here in the pancreas, this one is interesting because its cells are more of a um, asinar format. So you really see that kind of flat top triangle, triangular shape. And over in the salivary gland, all right, you've got the lining of the tube done in pretty classic simple cuboidal. And then over here, we've got simple cuboidal again. Um, some of them will look pretty much just standard shape. But at some of the ends where you've got big collection areas, those cells will start to take on kind of an asinar shape. And sometimes that can be a little tricky when you're trying to identify it because it just doesn't look like the standard square that you're used to. So you just need to remember that sometimes you lose the square, all right? Sometimes the square moves to more of a shape like that, or even sometimes even more extreme like that. And it is still considered cuboidal in shape. All right, next slide. So here's a nice classic example of our cells. So you got the simple cuboidal, you're making stuff in here, and then you're secreting it into the tube. Here is more of an alveolar shape to it. So you've got the simple cuboidal epithelium, and then the stuff is going into it. Now what's interesting about these two pictures is that they're showing you different types of exocytosis. So both of these are showing exocytosis, but this would be an example of the merocrine mode of secretion, whereas this would be an example of the holocrine mode of secretion. And I will explain why in a minute. So, but before we go on, let's put in some definitions for these modes of secretion. So, mo merocrine is classic exocytosis. You make it in the cell and then it pinches off a vesicle that opens up into the lumen and the product is secreted. Okay, you need to be careful with the salad and book. Once we get into the integumentary system, they have a bad habit of calling sudoriferous glands, specifically the eccrine and apocrine merocrine glands. I consider that sloppy and I don't like it. And um, I need you to learn the words eccrine and apocrine and what the differences are between them, between integumentary system. So just don't take the mode of secretion name and use that for a gland name. That's how we got in trouble with our apocrine glands. All right, apocrine mode of secretion. So we're just gonna clarify apocrine secretion. We, we don't use it in humans. I'm not even gonna really write down the definition, but basically it's where the cell kind of um, pinches off little bubbles that float as vesicles into the lumen. It's, it's kind of a tidy secretion and we don't do it. Um, but when we get into the tegumentary system, we will find 
an apocrine gland. An apocrine gland secretes this um, sticky, protein, lipid-rich fluid that has basically what we would consider pheromones in our anal genital region and the axillary region. So you can kind of think of it as the human sex glands, but not ovary testes, okay? Um, and don't call them sex glands. They secrete pheromones. Keep it simple. Anyway, apocrine glands use maracrine mode of secretion, despite the fact that they were named after apocrine secretion, mode of secretion, because the first people who defined it thought it used apocrine mode of secretion, but in humans, but it doesn't. It uses maracrine. So just don't mix up mode of secretion name with gland name. Use the gland names. I don't even if the book does it. You, I want you to do better. Okay, be better than the book. Um, if the book jumped off a bridge, would you? No. Anyway. Holocrine mode of secretion is basically where um, you're going to need stratified cells and the edges when they secrete will rupture so that the product that's secreted is both what was made but also cell fragments. So basically it's going to release product plus cell fragments and the most famous example of this is going to be your sapacious gland all right and then on the next slide let's look at an example of the sebaceous gland all right so now we're looking at the sebaceous gland which is using holocrine secretion so you see stacked cuboidal cells and the most apical cell right here, you will see it's got this funky shape. And basically, it is shattering. So instead of doing a nice, tidy exocytosis, the cell shatters, and then the product and cell fragments are going to be secreted out together. So that in this case, the sebum are both of these things. They are oils and they are cell fragments. Okay. All right. And then, and that is it for part four, talking about your glandular tissue. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there and you can move on to the next video.